Well, hello, Saddleback. Good to see you this weekend. I really enjoy visiting all of our different Saddlebacks this weekend. I'm actually at Rancho Capistrano and uh, having a good time with them. And, uh, you know, very excited. The next three weeks, we're starting three new Saddlebacks. Next weekend, we start Saddleback Hong Kong. The week after that, we start Saddleback Berlin. And the week after that, we start Saddleback Buenos Aires. So all three of those are coming up very, very, very soon. Now, if you'll pull out your message notes, we're in a series we started uh, just a week ago that I'm calling The Habits of Happiness. And we're looking verse by verse through the book of Philippians, which is the most positive, the most joyful, the happiest book in the Bible. Now, one of the common mistakes that we all make is we fall into the trap of what I call when and then thinking. When and then thinking, in other words, when such and such happens, then I'll be happy. And you have done this all your life, and so have I. We, we, we fall into this when and then thinking. When I get into, get into college, when I get married, when I have a baby, when I get a job, when, I, when my kids are born, when my kids leave the house, when, <laughs> when and then thinking then I'll be happy. Last week I shared with you five laws of happiness, and one of them is that happiness is a choice. You're as happy as you choose to be. If you're unhappy, you can't blame anybody for your unhappiness, because happiness is a choice. You don't go looking for happiness, you create it. It is something you create. And happiness, by the way, is not a goal. We talked about this last week. It is the byproduct of right thinking and right acting. Now, there are four common barriers to happiness. I want you to just write these down at the top of your notes there. Four common barriers. I call these the killjoys of life. Because when any of these uh, uh, enter into your life, then they're going to rob your happiness unless you're prepared for them. The first one, of course, is pain. Pain is a killjoy. It's hard to be happy and, uh, and, and in pain at the same time. This morning, Kay and I were moving some... Christmas boxes out of the attic down to the garage, which we had just remodeled a little bit, and, uh, and, and as she stepped down the stairs, she fell over backwards, yeah, and, uh, and, and really hurt herself, and for the next hour, she was in major pain. There's no way she was going to be happy while she was in pain, and I got, and got you know, was getting ice packs and things like that, and uh, uh, pain is, is a killjoy. Uh, but there's another one, and you're, you're familiar with this one too. I call it picky people. Picky people. Well, people of all kinds, actually, uh, can, can cause you to lose your joy. They can be irritating, they can be demanding, they can be uncooperative, they can be arrogant. People are common killjoy in life. Number three, pressure. Pressure can cause you to lose your happiness. And you can have pressure from within yourself or you can have it around you. It can be internal or it can be external. And then number four, and one you're all familiar with, of course, is problems. Problems. Uh, And there are all kinds of problems. So pain, people, pressures, and problems all are what I call the killjoys. Now, in Philippians chapter 1, verses uh, uh, 20, or excuse me, verses 12 down to about verse uh, 30 or so, um, he... Paul talks about all four of these killjoys. And we have an example of how to be happy no matter what's going on in your life. Now I want to remind you that Paul, when he writes this book, the happiest book, he's in prison. He's in prison in Rome. In fact, the last four years of Paul's life had gone like this before he wrote this happiest book uh, in the Bible. He spent two years in jail... Uh, in Caesarea on false charges. Two years in jail for false charges. Uh, Then uh, he is sent on the way to Rome, and he is shipwrecked in the Mediterranean Ocean on the way to Rome, and he ends up on a desert island in the Mediterranean, uh, and he's stranded there for a while with some people, and while he's there, there are some snakes, poisonous snakes on that island. He actually gets bit by a snake while he's there. then, uh, um, then he's imprisoned again for another two years uh, in Rome 
with a guard chained to him 24 hours a day. So he has no privacy at all. He's in prison in Rome with a, 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 a praetorian guard because he was such an important prisoner, chained to him 24 hours a day. He has no, no privacy. Now Paul has every reason to be bitter. He has every reason to be unhappy. He has every reason to be um, depressed and have a pity party. Instead he writes this book on happiness and on joy. Now let me read you uh, today's text. It's Philippians 1, 12 to 30. It starts like this. I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, Paul's writing, uh, that everything that has happened to me has helped me to spread the good news. For everyone here, including all the soldiers in the palace guard, know that I am in chains because of Christ. And I have gained confidence, oh, and because of my imprisonment, many of the Christians here have gained confidence and become more bold in telling others about Christ. Now, some are sharing Christ out of jealousy and rivalry. He's talking about the people who are outside. But others preach Christ with pure motives, and they love me, and they know that the Lord brought me here to defend the good news. But there are those who do not have pure motives as they preach about Christ. And they preach with selfish ambition, and they're not sincere, intending to make my time in prison more painful to me. But whether or not their motives are pure, the fact remains that the message about Christ is being preached, so I rejoice. And I will continue to rejoice no matter what. For I know that as you pray for me, he's writing to the people in the Philippi, the church in a city in Greece called Philippi, it's called Philippians. If he's writing to us, it'd be First Californians. For I know, he says, that you are praying for me, and as the Spirit of Jesus helps me, this will all turn out for my deliverance. And I live in eager expectation and hope. And then he says, I, I want my life to always honor Christ, whether I live or I die. For to me, living is for Christ and dying is, is even better. If I live, it just means more fruitful service, years of service for Christ, but I'm often torn between two desires. Sometimes I want to live, and sometimes I long to go on and be with Christ in heaven. That would be far better for me. But it's better for you if I live so that you can grow and that you can experience the joy of your faith. But whatever happens, you must live in a manner worthy of the good news about Christ. Don't be intimidated by your enemies. It will be a sign to them of their downfall that God's with you and that he will save you. For you have been given not only the privilege of trusting in Christ, but also the privilege of suffering for him. And we are in this fight together. You've seen me suffer for Christ in the past, and you know that I am still in the middle of a great struggle. Now, that's a very warm, personal note that Paul's writing. It's a very personal book. This letter he's writing to his friends in the church of Philippi that he started. And in this passage, he covers these four different killjoys. And he talks about how he has dealt with them, how he's maintained his happiness in spite of everything going in ways he hadn't planned. Now the key verse in this whole passage I just read is verse 27. It's there on your outline, and it says this. Whatever happens, whatever happens, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the good news of Christ. So in this passage, we learn how to be happy no matter what, even if you're in prison in Rome. And Paul models four habits. Let's get right into it. Number one, I can be happy no matter what happens in my life if, number one, I look at every problem from God's viewpoint. If I look at every problem from God's viewpoint. You see, happy people have a larger perspective. They have a bigger worldview. They see the big picture. When I don't have the big picture, when I don't see things from God's point of view, I get discouraged, I get frustrated, I get unhappy. The reason we get unhappy is because we don't see what God does. Now the truth is, no matter what's going on in your life, the good, bad, and the ugly, God is working out a plan. 
And he even takes all of our mistakes and he even puts those into the plan. He says, I can use that too. My sins, yes. My faults, yes. What other people do, yes. God says, I can, I can fit it all into the plan. And Paul knew this. And so he starts out, the first verse is verse 12, and he says this. Now I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, that everything that has happened to me has helped spread the good news. Now let me explain what's going on here. Ever since Paul had become a Christian on the road to Damascus, he had dreamed one great dream, and that was this. I want to preach in Rome. (laughs) Rome is the center of the universe. Rome is the capital of the empire. Rome is the most prestigious, powerful, strategic city in the world. We've picked out 12 of those strategic cities where we're planting this year and next year churches at Saddleback. But if we had been planning in those days, we would have been planning in Rome. There's no doubt about that. There was no nation more important uh, than than, uh, the Roman Empire, and there was no city more important than Rome. So Paul's dream is sharing Christ at the center of the universe. And what he wants to do is this. He wants to go to Rome, he wants to rent the Colosseum, and he wants to do a harvest crusade for six months. (laughs) That's what Paul's thinking. I'm going to Rome to preach. God had another idea. Paul, you're going to go as a prisoner. And I'm going to make you a royal prisoner of Caesar. Now, does anybody know who was Caesar at this point? Nero. You ever heard of that guy? Yeah, Nero. About as wicked and as bad as you can get. So, Rome, uh, Paul is a, is a prisoner of Nero. And as a royal prisoner with a royal guard chained to him 24 hours a day, he gets to talk to all kinds of key people he would never otherwise talk to because he's an important prisoner. He's chained 24 hours a day to a palace guard for two years. They changed that guard every four hours. So I added it up. Over two years, he witnessed to 4,380 guards. Now my question is, Who's the real prisoner here? Who has the captive audience? Paul is talking to the entire court of Caesar's palace. And God says, this is my plan. You want to go do the big city lights national crusade, but I'm going to put you in prison. And there were two results of it we know for sure. Chapter 4, when we get to later on, will tell us that within two years, some of Nero's own family had become believers because Paul was a prisoner in Rome. Some of the royal family had become Christians because Paul was in prison. And second, Paul, it's kind of like Rick Warren, it's hard to get him to sit down, sit still, not stop moving. He's forced to sit still, and he, as a result, writes the New Testament. (laughs) Hmm. I wonder which had a bigger impact. Go do Harvest Crusade in in the Colosseum or be forced to sit still hour after hour and write Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and on and on. 1st, 2nd Timothy and 1st, 2nd Thessalonians and most of the New Testament. This is why Paul says, I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, that everything that has happened to me, being in prison, has helped spread the good news. So he says, I've got... I've got my plan, but God has a bigger plan. And he says, I can be happy because I can see what God is doing through my problem. Now, I'm going to just stop right here for a second. I want you to think of a, a problem that you're facing right now in your life. Okay? Think of a problem that you're facing in your life, and I want us to bow our heads for 30 seconds. Okay? Just bow your head, and I want you to say these words in your, in your heart. God, help me to see this problem from your perspective. Help me to see this problem with eyes of faith. Amen. Now, any time you have a problem and it's starting to get you down, you're starting to be unhappy, you need to do what Paul does. Learn to see it from God's point of view. What is God doing here? What's the bigger picture? What's the bigger perspective? And then you'll be able to face the problem in faith. And when you face the problem in faith, two things will happen. Write these down. First, it's a witness to unbelievers. When Christians handle big problems, 
in faith, it is a witness to unbelievers. That's why in verse 13 he says, for everyone here, talking about the palace guard and in his, the royal prison, everyone here, including all the soldiers in the palace guard, knows that I'm in chains because of Christ. Well, I guess so. He'd witnessed over 4,000 times the guys chained to him. It's a witness to unbelievers. Number two, it's an encouragement to believers. In verse 14, he says this, And because of my imprisonment, many of the Christians here have gained confidence, those in Rome. And they've become more bold in telling others about Christ. It's a witness to unbelievers. It's an encouragement to believers. Have you ever thought that God might want to use the problem you're going through right now for the very same reason? You know, since Matthew died, both of these have been true in my life. It has been a witness to unbelievers. It's been an encouragement to believers. Why? Because Kay and I looked at the problem from God's perspective, not our own, and we, we faced it in faith. This week, the story went out in People magazine. I never imagined in my lifetime that I would ever be on People Magazine. I mean, I know I'm that good looking, but, <laughs> but I never imagined in my lifetime that I would be in People on the cover of People Magazine. So how many people have heard the gospel since Matthew died? Millions. Millions. Because of all of the, 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 uh, the, the stories and the interviews and the CNN and all that. Millions have heard the good news. And I could say, like Paul, I want you to know, friends, that all that has happened to me has worked out for the furthering of the good news. Have you ever thought that that might be true in the problem in your life? If you will look at it from that way, it's going to change your perspective in a major way. All right, number two. Second habit. I can be habit no matter what happens if I never let others control my attitude. And this is a good example of Paul gives us right here in this passage. I can be happy no matter what happens in my life if I never let others control my attitude. I don't let them decide whether I'm going to be happy or not. Now Paul, in this next section, uh, he talks about... Um, uh, four kinds of people. And while he's in, in prison, he says, now there, there are some people who are attacking my ministry. Uh, they, they slandered Paul. They judged Paul. They, they criticized Paul. Uh, they were, they were uh, uh, gossip mongers. There were some people who supported his ministry that were friends. Uh, there were some who competed with his ministry. They're trying to kick him while he's down. And there were some who were... Um, uh, 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 you know, undermining his ministry. They're even trying to destroy him. They're trying to rub it in. He's in prison. They're trying to make it more painful. And in Philippians chapter 1, verses 15 to 17, Paul describes four kinds of people. Three of them are killjoys. One's a good kind. And he says, uh, there are four kinds of people in my life. There are critics, uh, you know, who are, who are slandering me and who are creating all kinds of controversy. There are comrades, that's my friends. There are competitors... Who are, who are preaching Christ out of rivalry, and he said they're conspirators who just want to make my problem worse. They want to rub it in. They want to kick me while I'm down, while I'm in prison. They're my enemies. Now notice these verses there on your outline. The first verse, this is verse 15, talking about critics. He says, It is true that some preach Christ because they are jealous and quarrelsome. Circle the word quarrelsome. That word in Greek is the word eris, E-R-I-S. And it means they love to argue have you ever met anybody like that they love to argue they, they love conflict they enjoy creating controversy they enjoy getting into a cat fight these people are contentious they are divisive they are critical have you ever heard a radio preacher like that they're out there have you ever read a blogger or saw somebody on social media who was contentious and critical of somebody's ministry or this or that. If you haven't, just go to my website. <laughs> and you'll find hundreds. There'll be plenty. Now, now notice the here. He says they're jealous and they're quarrelsome. Notice that the critic's motive is usually jealousy. When people criticize something, they usually are jealous. 
of it. But what he's saying here is, he says, you know, I have to deal with these people, and, and, and would you agree that few things could rob your happiness faster than being criticized? When you're criticized at work, or you're criticized by friends, or you're criticized by neighbors, your stomach starts churning. Why? Because we all want to be loved. We all want to be approved. We want everybody to like us. So let me give you a little happiness hint, one of those little HHs. You might write this down. I don't need other people's approval to be happy. I don't need other people's approval. I don't need other people's permission to be happy. You're as happy as you choose to be. If they're unhappy, that's their choice. But you don't have to depend on other people's approval in order to be happy. And if you haven't got it now, you're probably not going to get it. And you're going to be miserable if you try to live for the approval of everybody else. Paul is modeling here, never let others control your attitude. And some of these people, they're, they're just jealous and they're quarrelsome and they're, they're cranky and they criticize everything I do in my ministry. And then in the next verse, verse 16, he talks about the good guys. These are his friends. These are his comrades. He says, others preach Christ from genuine goodwill. And they do so out of love. That's the real reason we share the good news, out of love. And they know that God has given me the work of defending the gospel. So he says, you know, those people bring me joy, obviously. And then in verse 17, he talks about another killjoy, competitors. He says, others preach Christ insincerely from a spirit of selfish ambition. Circle the phrase selfish ambition. He said, these, he said there, I, I hate to say this, but there are actually people in ministry. There are people with national ministries, radio, television, and books, and who are ego-driven. And how do you know when somebody's ego-driven? They put other people down all the time to build themselves up. That's when you know somebody's ministering in selfish ambition. They feel compelled to put other people down in order to build themselves up. Now, you're not a preacher, but if you're in any kind of business, you have competitors. And if you don't deal with this, you will, competitors will rob your happiness. And you'll look at, well, look at what they're doing. You can have competition over the color of your lawn. <laughs> Neighbor's yard's greener. We better get ours going. You can have competition over the car you drive. You can have competition over your kids. My kid was student of the month at Folsom Prison. <laughs> you know? <laughs> you know? And, and, you know, I, you know I, I, I always wanted to, when I had, my kids were in grade school, I always wanted to put one and say, my kid can beat your kid up. <laughs> but, you know, that's competition. My kid, my kid, and I'm so proud. You can compete over hairstyles. You can compete over shoes. Don't look at people right now, but you know that's true. You know that's true. And, and, and if you don't deal with this, you're going to be unhappy a lot of your life because critics will rob your happiness and competitors will rob your happiness. And Paul says, you know what? Even in the ministry, there are competitors. And they're selfishly, uh, 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 ambitiously and insincerely preaching the good news. And then in the second part of verse 17, he talks about conspirators or enemies. These are people who just want to mess him up. He says, other people just want to stir up more trouble for me. And they want to add to my pain while I'm, I'm in prison. I did a whole series on this, remember, called The Crazy Makers. Remember that one? Crazy Makers. There are troublemakers, there are crazy makers, and they will rob your happiness unless you know how to deal with them. By the way, do you know what is the favorite tool of crazy makers and troublemakers? Gossip. Gossip. Gossip is the number one sign of a troublemaker. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs that a person who gossips is as bad as a saboteur. They're an emotional terrorist. That's what the Bible says. You should not gossip. Now, you're going to have all four of these in your life. Critics, comrades, competitors, and conspirators. I certainly have. Don't let them rob you. Now, I want you to see Paul's attitude toward... He says, I'm in prison. I'm already down and these guys are kicking me while I'm down critics conspirators and 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 
you know, competitors. You know, they're, they're trying to get at me. Look at verse 18. Here's Paul's attitude. What others do, he says, what they do, what, what these people do, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter. Circle that. The important thing is that in every way, whether for right or wrong reasons, the message of Christ is being shared. So, he says, I am happy and I will continue to be happy. I love that. I'm not going to let other people control my attitude. There may be people criticizing me for what I'm doing. There may be people competing for me, with what I'm doing. There may be people who are conspiring to make sure I fail in what I'm doing. But it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. What I'm going to do is I'm going to focus on Christ and I am choosing to be happy and I will continue to be happy. He says, I'm not going to let anybody steal my joy. There are a few well-known guys in America who like to take pot shots at me, pastors and people. And, and every once in a while on so, social media, some will say, Pastor Rick, have you heard what so-and-so said about you and what do you think about them? And my answer is always the same. It's been the same for years and years and years. And I say this, what, and I mentioned that person today, what they think of me in no way controls what I think of them. And I have nothing but the highest admiration for their ministry. Why? I'm not going to let anybody rob my joy. I'm not going to let anybody rob my happiness. I don't care what they say about me. They do not control what I choose to think about them. And that's why I don't let people rob my happiness. Some of you remember, I told you this during the last series that you know, when, when Matthew died, there were some really mean-spirited people out there who were saying all kinds of vile and mean things and celebrating Matthew's death and saying I should die and go to hell too and on and on and on. And I remember you know, going through that fire and Greg Laurie, my friend, asked me, he said, Rick, uh, what do you feel coming out of this? And I said, honestly, I feel fearless. I told you that. I said, I honestly feel fearless. I said, because the truth is, if I ever cared about what other people think, I certainly don't now. Okay, you can't throw anything worse at me than what, what's been thrown at me in the last six months. You, you just can't. And I said, I feel fearless. And I've always felt that since, since that moment, since he asked that. And then this week I was studying this passage, and I saw verse 28, where Paul says this, be fearless. Be fearless, no matter who opposes you. It will be a sign to them of their downfall and that God is with you and that he will save you. Okay, so the cool thing here is, is if I want to stay happy, even if I'm in prison, I look at everything that's going on in my life from God's viewpoint and I realize he's going to work it all out for good. And it's worked out for the gospel. It's a witness to unbelievers. It's an encouragement to believers. And then I just say, no matter who the critics are and who the complainers are and who the conspirators are and who the competitors are, they're just not going to stop me from being happy. Uh, you know, I'm going to keep my focus right and, uh, and, I, and I'm going to be fearless. Jesus said it like this in Matthew chapter 5. It's called the Beatitudes. It's the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. He says this. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. He says, celebrate. And Paul explains why you can be happy no matter what. Look at the next verse, verse 29 and 30. He says this, For you have been given not only the privilege of trusting in Christ, but also the privilege of suffering for him. We are in this fight together. Paul says, You have seen me suffer for him in the past, and you know that I'm still in the midst of a great struggle. Paul says, it is a privilege to suffer when you're doing the right thing. Great is your reward in heaven. He said it's a privilege to believe in Christ and it's a privilege to suffer with Christ and for Christ. Because you're most like Jesus. 
when somebody's nailing you to a cross. When somebody's trying to, to get at you. So he says, I am not going to let other people rob my happiness. I can be happy no matter what happens if I look at every problem from God's viewpoint and I can be happy no matter what happens if I never let what other people say or never let what other people do control my happiness. They just don't. Number three. Here's the third habit. It's the next three or four verses, verses 19 to 20. I can always be happy no matter what happens if I always trust God to work things out. I can always be happy no matter what happens if I always trust God to work things out. I, I don't try to work it out myself. When things are falling apart, I don't try to put them back together. I just let God put them back together. This is the faith factor. You've heard me say this before, that when you're going through a problem, you've got two options. You can worship or you can worry. That's it. Worship or worry, worship or worry, worship or worry. And if you worshiped more, you'd have a whole lot less to worry about. You can pray or you can panic. And those are the options you've got. This is the faith factor. Paul says this in Philippians 1.19. I will continue to rejoice. Now circle the word, phrase, I will. Will, that's an act of the will. It is your choice to rejoice. I don't care how bad things are in your life right now, it's your choice to rejoice. It's an act of the will. He says, I will continue to rejoice in spite of all the things that's going on that are bad. For I know, circle that, I'll come back and explain this in a minute. For I know that as you pray for me, circle pray for me, and as the Spirit of Jesus Christ helps me, circle that, Spirit of Jesus Christ help me, all that's happened will all turn out for my deliverance. Now this is a very powerful verse here. And in that one verse, Paul gives four sources of strength in tough times. You just circle them. Four sources of strength. And this is how you stay positive. This is how you stay happy no matter what happens in your life. He says, first, uh, my first source of strength is I have God's perspective on my problems. That's when he says, for I know. It's what you know that keeps you going. He says, I, I know God is working in this. I have God's perspective on my, on my problems, for I know. And then he says, number two, I have people praying for me. And he said, that keeps me going. And then he says, I have the Holy Spirit helping me. And that keeps me going. And then he says, I, you know, I expect that I'm going to be delivered. So he says, I have faith that God will work it for, for good. And so I've got perspective, I've got prayer, I've got the Holy Spirit, and I've got faith. And then he says, therefore, I choose to be happy. I will continue to rejoice. That's your choice, to rejoice. Finally, number four. I can be happy no matter what happens in my life. If I look at every problem from God's viewpoint, if I never let other people control my attitude, if I always trust God to work things out, and number four, if I stay focused on my purpose, not my problems. God's purpose for my life. If I stay focused on my purpose, not my problem, I can be happy even when life seems to be falling apart. I stay focused on my purpose, Paul says, not my problem. Now picture this. Paul is old. He's an old man now. He's in prison. He's a long way from home. He's in Rome. He is awaiting death by execution. These are not exactly normally happy times. And they have taken away everything from Paul. They've taken away his friends, They've taken away his freedom. They have taken away his ministry to travel around. They have even taken away his privacy. He's got a guard chained to him 24 hours a day. But there's one thing they cannot take away from Paul. His purpose. It cannot be taken away from him. And his ability to make choices. I never forget reading Viktor Frankl's book, and man's search for meaning. Viktor Frankl was a Jewish psychiatrist who was taken to one of the 
uh, Dachau, Auschwitz, Buchenwald, death camps in, in Nazi Germany. And all of his family and all of his friends and everybody were being gassed and murdered and killed. And he said, I remember one day when we stood in front of the Gestapo, stark naked, they'd taken away our clothes, they'd even taken away my wedding ring. I stood there with nothing at all. And he said, all of a sudden I realized there was one thing they could not take away from me. And it was my choice in how I would respond. Nobody could take that away from me. I cannot control what other people do to me. I cannot control what other people do around me. But I can control how I respond. And Paul says, I'm going to stay focused on my purpose, even though they've taken away everything from They could not take away his purpose. And what was his purpose? Serving God by serving others. Look at this. Philippians chapter 1, verses 22 to 25. He's talking about the conundrum of sometimes I want to go to heaven and sometimes I want to stay here and serve the Lord to help other people. And he says this, verse 22, if by continuing to live I can do more worthwhile work for Christ, then I'm not sure which I should choose. Remember, he's old, he's in prison, he's waiting execution. If I continue to live, I can do more worthwhile work for Christ. So I'm not sure what I should choose. I'm pulled in two directions. I want very much to leave this life and be with Christ, which is a far better thing. But for your sake, for your sake, it's much more important that I remain alive. Notice Paul saying, I stay alive not for my sake, but for your sake. I am sure of this. I'm sure of this, that for your sake it's more important that I remain alive. So, I know that I will stay on with you all so that I can add to your progress and your joy in the faith. Now, here's an amazing thing. Paul is such an amazing man. He doesn't just have a purpose for living. He's got a purpose for dying. We talk about purpose in life a lot. Do you have purpose in death? Paul says, I've got a, it doesn't matter whether I live or whether I die. I've got a purpose. I've got a purpose either way. On earth, my purpose is to serve God by serving other people. How do you serve God on earth? You can't serve God directly because you can't even see him. The only way you can serve God on earth is by serving other people in Jesus' name. That's why we do the peace plan. We serve God by serving others. When you give a cup of cold water in his name, when you help an orphan, when you care for the sick, when you assist the poor, when you educate the next generation, when you fight corruption, when you plant a church, the, all the things we do in peace plan, you're serving God by serving others, meeting needs in Jesus' name. And he says, so when I'm, when I'm alive, my whole purpose is simply to serve Christ by serving people. They say, when I die, my purpose is to be with Christ. So either way, I win. Either way. He says, I stay alive just for the sake of others. And he said, actually, selfishly, it would be better for me if I go ahead and die. Because when I die, I'm going to a place where there are no problems, no pressures, no picky people, and no pain. In other words, there are no killjoys in heaven. So he said, selfishly, I'm ready to die. I'm ready to go to heaven. But he says, I stay alive for the sake of others. Now, I don't want you to miss this secret. Because most people on this planet do. They miss the secret I'm about to tell you. The reason why most people are miserable is because they think that happiness comes from self-gratification. If I just get more possessions, if I get more pleasures, if I get more uh, uh, position, if I get sex, salary, status, if I get more things, if I live for myself, if I get better stuff for me, I'll be happier. That doesn't work. Actually, self-gratification is not the way to happiness. The way to happiness is self-sacrifice not self-gratification. Paul says, the reason I'm happy is because as long as I'm alive, I'm giving my life away to help others. Are you doing that? Or are you living for yourself? If you're living for yourself, I can tell you right now, you're not very happy. You aren't. Because happiness does not come from status, and happiness does not come from salary, and happiness does not come from sex. Happiness comes from service. And giving your life away. And until you understand that, you're not going to be happy much of your life. 
Happiness does not come from self-gratification. It comes from self-sacrifice. I want to pause right now in this message because I want to give you exhibit A of self-sacrifice. You know, because we believe God said take the message of the good news to the whole world. We do that. We, we think that's important to do. And that's why we're starting 12 Saddlebacks in the next couple of years. Saddleback Tokyo, Saddleback Bangalore, Saddleback Hong Kong, Saddleback Buenos Aires, and, and Mexico City, and Amman, Jordan, and, and Berlin, and London. This next week, we're sending out a couple that have been in this church. One of them grew up in this church, was born here, to start Saddleback Moscow. Andrew and Alyssa Lasso are here, and I'm going to ask them to come out on stage, and we're going to have a prayer of commissioning, because next week, they're moving to Moscow. All right, so come on out, guys. Come on, guys. Come on, guys, pastors, come on out. This is the example of self-sacrifice. <laughs> and I could not be more proud of them. Love you guys. I'm really proud of you. So. Now. You know, Andrew started out as a volunteer. He just started volunteering to help and serve and started going on peace trips and God put it on his heart. Well, maybe, maybe God might want to use me. And he, 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 he actually believed when I said that thing about the most dangerous prayer you could pray. Two words, use me. Remember that one, the most dangerous? And he said it. Well, guess what? Okay. And Alyssa, of course, is Pastor Tom's daughter. <laughs> yeah, and, and of course, Alyssa grew up in this church and actually started working in Saddleback Kids while she was still a kid. It was illegal because as a pastor's daughter, she got in. Okay, and, and she was volunteering just even as a child herself and served and served and served, and God put it on their heart. This is what it means to have true happiness. To say, God, I am willing to do whatever, whenever, however. Now, I guarantee you, five years ago, ten years ago, if you had asked either of these people, can you imagine going to, moving to Moscow, Russia, to help start a church, they would say, you're nuts. Okay? Because if I asked you right now, you'd say, you're nuts. But if you had asked me when I was in high school and had a garage rock band, do you think you'll be pastor of a mega church one day, I'd say, you're nuts. And if you'd seen me, you would have said, he's nuts. <laughs> Hair down to here. And, you know. <laughs> so you never know where you're going to end up. You just don't. But when you say, God, I'm willing to be your person, then he can do amazing things through you. And God's work done God's way will not lack God's support. So I want our pastors, and Shondell, oh, hi. I didn't see you there. I'm going to see you. I want you guys to lay hands on these guys, and I'm going to pray a prayer of commissioning right now. Father, I thank you that you raise up men and women who are fearless, who say, I will move against all my petty fears and says, I could never do that. I will stop making excuses, and I'll say, God, anywhere, any way, Whichever, I don't know it, but if you call me, I'll do it. God, we know that where you guide, you provide. I thank you, Lord, for people who are willing to face their fears. And I pray it would be a model to every one of us. And that we would realize that in facing our fears, in moving against the things we're scared to do, we find our greatest joy. I thank you, Lord, that we serve Jesus by serving others. I thank you, Lord, already in advance that Andrew and Alyssa are a success. It doesn't matter what the church what does and how big it gets because you have said love never fails. 
And they're doing this in love. So regardless of the result, because they're doing it in love, they cannot be a failure. Love never fails. And if ultimately what we're doing is for your glory and the growth of your family, and we do it in faith and we do it in love, we're already a success. So we thank you in advance. I pray that you would protect their bodies, protect their minds, protect their family, protect their marriage. I pray that uh, in the days of a long winter, you'd give them a, a memory of Southern California. <laughs> and Lord, we send them out with our prayers, with our love, and just as the church at Antioch sent out their best, Paul and Barnabas, we send out our best today. And we thank you that we're taking the good news into the heart of a city that used to control half of the earth. Lord, when we used to think of Russia and Moscow, we thought of the enemy. But these people aren't enemies. These people are people you died for, that you love. And I pray that just as Moscow for 80 years influenced half of the world, that one day Moscow will influence half of the world for Jesus Christ. And I pray that as we establish this foothold of a Saddleback Church in Moscow to go out and reach unreached people groups in Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, and all the other stands, that, Lord, you would use this couple and you would use us. And I pray that you would call others out. And I know that even today there are people who are praying this prayer, standing here, who don't know yet that you're going to call them to do something. And you're going to fill them with joy too. We pray this blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. God bless you guys. Be seated. One last verse on your outline. Paul sums up his purpose. If I want to be happy, I've got to stay focused on my purpose, not my problems. And so Paul sums up his purpose in verse 21. For me to live is Christ. That's a pretty simple purpose. And to die is gain. Now let me ask you this. For me to live is Christ. If somebody came up to you today and asked you to fill in the blank, what word would you use? For me to live is entertainment. For me to live is sports, golf, baseball, football. For me to live is clothes. For me to live is make money. For me to live is my family. For me to live is friends. You see, there can be a lot of good things, but nothing deserves the place of for me to live except the one who created you and gave you your life, Jesus Christ. For me to live is Christ. And I want to say this. How you fill in that blank will determine how happy you are in life. Because if you say for me to live is money, uh uh-uh. You're going to be unhappy a lot of your life. For me to live a success, you're not going to be happy a lot of your life. For me to live as fame, pleasure, possession, position, power, prestige, there's nothing wrong with those things. They just don't deserve first place in your life. You weren't created to make a bunch of money, die, and give it away. No, no, God has a far greater purpose in your life. For me to live is Christ. There's only one answer that leads to happiness and I want you to be honest and settle this issue so let's bow our heads as we pray. And as I pray this prayer you say dear Jesus me too in your mind. Dear Jesus you know that I often let circumstances determine my happiness and you know that I often allow the killjoys of pain and problems and pressures and picky people to rob my happiness. Starting today, I want to practice the four secrets that Paul modeled. Help me to look at every problem in my life from your viewpoint. I want to handle problems in a way that it's a witness to non-believers and an encouragement to believers. Help me to remember that what others say and do does not control my happiness unless I allow it. And as for the things that happen that I don't understand or can't figure out, I want to trust you to work it all out for good. 
Help me to stay focused on your purpose for my life, not my problems. I want to use the rest of my life to serve you by serving others. And I pray that most dangerous prayer, Lord, use me. And so I have a purpose for living and for dying, and my purpose for living is to serve you by serving others. And then I want to be with you in heaven for eternity. And from this day on, from this day on, for me to live will be Christ. In your name I pray. Amen.